Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. In today's video, yes, we're here again. We're at Glass Bren, the agroecological permaculture market garden in the correct month this time. It's quite warm in the polytunnel, so maybe I don't need this. Plus, come up with a fancy transition idea. You ready? Welcome back. <laughs> they good? Yeah, I think so. So welcome back to the market garden at Glass Bren. It's the month of October. Uh, and today I'm going to take you through what things are looking like at the garden and tell you about some really cool events we just had to celebrate the harvest. So a couple of weeks back we ran the first ever harvest version of CD Saturday Kamala. Now I've been running a spring version of the event the last two years but this year was the first time that we ran a harvest version to celebrate the abundance of the harvest that we've all grown from the seeds we swapped back in March. So this was an event with an eco fair full of producers and makers and local environmental groups and community growing groups, seed providers, just all the coolest, most exciting things happening in the kind of eco permaculture world around where we live. There's also a seed swap. We invite people to bring their surplus produce to be used in our local Pay As You Can community canteen, Keg and Hedden. And we also had a great talks and workshops tent where we welcomed some pretty great people like uh, we had Sarah Venn, from Edible Bristol, Stephanie Haverty, the No Dig Guru, and author Liz Zorab talking about the power of food growing. We also had a great panel discussing the future of local food. We had a fermentation demo with my co-director Steph and good friend and chef Elderflower Jam and loads of great food and just really great times. It was a really amazing atmosphere, feeling like people coming together around something so um, important, so rooted in the land and so positive as uh, growing food and gardening and, and the way we're all working together towards uh, a better world for our local area. And then in the evening, our extra special Glass Bren Harvest Feast. So we gathered 60 people from our community in a beautiful space under a church to enjoy several courses of amazing local and heritage foods from Chef Jam, Welsh folk music from uh, Owen Shears from Carnarvon. It was just a really special atmosphere that kind of had this real rightness about it, this idea of people coming together on a long table. And that's really a big part of what Glass Bren's about. And we can't talk about the market garden and the growing and the project without talking about the reasons behind why we do it. And I think the people side of the project is as important, if not more important, than the way we grow food. And the people that we grow it for, we know them all by name. They're members throughout the season, if not multiple seasons, and, look, and standing up there on that harvest feast and looking out over all the faces of those 60 plus people who, many and most of whom, probably 80% of whom, have some at some point in some way interacted with the project. And that's a really special feeling. And it's something that, for me, starts to feel like really true, authentic culture built around something as, as common and shared and important and every day too, as food and how it's produced, where it's produced and who produces it. So in terms of what I've talked about in a few videos through this year uh, about why we do community supported agriculture, why we do things the way we do, is that element of people having a relationship with the people who grow their food, but not just that, but like creating culture and creating community and creating these events around that food as excuses and ways to bring people together in really meaningful uh, and authentic ways and we really felt that on that night and Jason who's behind the camera he captured that night and that day beautifully in photography so you'll see those scattered through this video too. Yeah and this month given that we've just had Seedy Saturday which is all about seeds, seed saving, seed swapping, there was actually a practical seed saving workshop at the event with the Whale Seed Hub and Incredible Seed Library so this month I thought it was perfect if I talked a little bit about something that's quite important to us here at Glass Bren and over the years has been quite a key part of our growing methods is seed saving. Now I did talk back I think in March's video about seed saving and about why we save seeds and the politics of seeds and all the different reasons why it's important for us as gardeners and farmers and growers to, to save our own seeds. But this month I thought given that it's harvest time, time to harvest seeds, I might show you a couple of techniques of how we do it. So let's go and do that. talking about a few practical methods for seed saving today. So there's 
so many different types of seeds come in all shapes and sizes and there are so many different types of seed saving methods that we can't really go into all of them today and also it started to rain quite a lot outside now so we won't be going outside to do any processing of seeds out there but I thought inside here I could show you a couple of techniques that are used for basic seed saving. It's quite an involved thing and it takes quite a lot of knowledge and um, it's worth going into the books and the videos that are out there but I'm just going to show you a couple of methods that that we use and we're using right now to save seeds. So like I said seeds come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Some of them like these poppies come in seed heads. So these are poppies that have gone to seed, um, set seed and then these seed heads have been dried out and actually by now this, these have all kind of made their way out. I don't know if you can see here but they've made their way out of the seed heads and they've all kind of collected in the bottom of this bag. So that's a really easy way to save seeds is just to get them in a bag and sort of so some really simple ones, beans are a classic, really easy to save. All we need to do with these, we've just picked them. These are the ones that have been left on the plant, we haven't harvested for eating, but we've let them grow to their full size and then they'll be dried out here in the tunnel. Uh, and once they've dried out, we can just pop the beans out of their pods. Another easy one is squash. Squash is a classic, because when we eat them, we just cut them open, scoop the seeds out, dry those seeds, and those can be used the following year. Now, it's important to be aware that with squash, if you've grown multiple varieties of squash, it's not great to save the seed because they'll have cross-pollinated. And when squash cross-pollinate, you usually end up with a lesser version of the squash, usually quite tasteless and not very nice to eat. So um, if you want to save seed from your squash, only grow one variety um, and keep them isolated from other types of cucurbits in that family. So what I wanted to show you today is um, cucumbers. So this might not look like a cucumber um, to your to what we're used to seeing from cucumbers as long green things but this is a cucumber that we've left on the plant and allowed to go a little bit past its best you can even let them go to rotting because then we know that the seeds are at their full maturity uh, we've selected the best plants that we want to save from what we do basically the simple thing is just cut it open cut open the cucumber and you can see that's got a load of seed in it but what you can also see is that those seeds are coated in a layer of this really gloopy jelly, right? So it's the same with cucumbers and tomatoes. They both live in their fruits in a casing of this jelly-like substance. And there's a really good reason for that. That jelly-like coating stops the seed from germinating inside the fruit. So when a seed is living in, in water, essentially, which it is in a cucumber or a tomato, there's no reason why it wouldn't just germinate and try to make a plant. So that jelly coating is what stops it from doing that. So when we save the seeds, we want, to do, we want to get rid of that jelly coating. We want to get it off the seed so that we can dry it and have it ready to, to sow and germinate next year. And to do that, we use what's called the wet processing method in seed saving. It's a fermentation process to break down the jelly coating of the seed in both tomatoes and cucumbers. In this case, I'm gonna show you with cucumbers. So all I did, actually a couple of uh, volunteers helped scoop out all of the cucumber seeds from inside a big cucumber into this jar. We simply added a little bit of water, put a covering over it and put it in a nice warm place. We put it in uh, the boiler house. It's a nice warm dry place. And within two, three days, a fermentation process happens and essentially mold grows. And then the fermentation process breaks down the jelly coating on the seeds and they fall to the bottom, right? So these seeds now have lost their jelly coating and they're ready to be processed and I'm just going to show you how we do that. So, so all you're doing now is tipping it gently and pouring away the water and can you see that the seeds are all gathered in this little well here so we really don't want to tip too fast because all we're trying to do is get rid of all the gloop and slowly get rid of the water without losing the seeds. Now any seeds that have sort of floated to the top and are falling out right now are, are the ones that aren't so good, right? So all the good seeds are gathered down here. So before the seeds start falling out, I'm gonna add some more water. And this kind of helps to give the seeds a proper wash. This is a really good jar for this because it's got this nice lip here. It helps hold back the seeds. And when your seeds start to look like they might start tipping out, we flick it back 
and I might just do one more. Just give them a swirl around, nice good clean. And get rid of all the water. And then we have a load of seeds. That's just from a couple of cucumbers. And that's going to be more than enough for what we need next year. Um, and then what we do is spread these out onto a piece of cardboard, a piece of paper, put them somewhere warm and dry, maybe a window ledge, a dehydrator if you have one, uh, the tunnel, um, although it's getting a bit damp this time of year, so you might want to focus on somewhere a little drier. Dry those out, store them in a cool, dry place, and there you have it. Cucumber seeds ready for next year. Okay, section of the video for a question to pose to Abel. Same as all the other months, I've only got a few months left now, so if you want to ask Abel anything, put your question down in the comments of any of the videos, and I'll ask Abel either in the rest of the months or at the end of the year, we're planning on doing a much longer Q&A with a whole list of questions from um, you guys, basically. But today's question, we have, well, questions, we have two. The first one is from GoGoKate17. Thank you for making these beautiful and interesting videos. Thank you, Kate. That's uh, very nice. It does. It still feels weird to actually have people say nice things. <laughs> like, because sometimes it still feels like, especially with some of these at the moment, they're only getting a few hundred views here and there. It feels strange. Like, it's great meeting your family that had come from New Zealand that watches it. Like, knowing yeah, that yeah. people are watching it in different countries is kind of like, oh, that's so cool. Like, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you, Kate. And they ask, have you ever had issues with cross-pollination in and out of the polytunnel, uh, inside and outside the polytunnel, considering you grow so many different crops together? Yeah, good question. Hi, Kate. Um, I haven't had any issues, but that's for very specific reasons, which is that um, for things that we're wanting to save seed from, if they're a crop that needs to be isolated, uh, we don't use a polytunnel as a means of isolation. It's not, a polytunnel isn't sufficient means of isolation, though it will create a bit more isolation than if everything was out in the open together. Um, it's not to be relied upon because obviously you still want insects coming in your polytunnel. You want pollination happening. So you don't want to shut, shut out the pollinators from your polytunnel crops. Things that we grow in polytunnels are typically mostly things that we don't need to worry too much about cross-pollination. Or if we do, we try not to grow two things from the same family. So to give you an example, um, growing cucumbers in the tunnel, try not to grow anything else that they would cross with, right? So that's from their, their part of the cucumber family. Um, tomatoes generally don't cross-pollinate. So tomatoes you don't really need to worry about, so you can have different varieties of tomatoes. Um, in a tunnel and still save seeds from one specific variety if you want to. Um, beans, again, like I would only grow one variety of beans in a tunnel, but beans don't need to be isolated so far apart as, for example, brassicas, which need to be isolated, you know, two miles apart at least. So, um, yeah, so I'm not a seed saving expert, but those are some basic things where um, if you really need to isolate things, you need to take more concerted steps towards doing that. So whether that's with netting or, you know, with squash, for example, covering the flowers when necessary. So that's another whole thing, you know, it's another whole set of skills and it's another whole consideration that can be quite hard to build into a market garden setting because you're also trying to produce loads of food and you can't afford to use up space for other things, or it can just be too complicated to save lots of different varieties of seeds. So maybe it's worth just concentrating on one or two um, each year and getting loads of those to, to do you the next two, three years. Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. And thank you. Um, Thanks and for watching, Kate. We have another question here. This comes from Chris Kolarisu. See if he's watching. <laughs> one of my mates. And I'm gonna see if he's watching today. His question is, following on from last month's video about harvesting, 
Could you talk about some different ways that you store vegetables throughout the winter? Yep. So in this video, uh, Louisa talked about, um, was it in this video or was it last? Last month's video. So, We're forgetting which month it was. I don't know when. So in last month's video, <laughs> yeah. Louisa showed you fermentation, which is obviously a really great way of preserving um, vegetables. Uh, we also do some canning. So tomatoes, we bottle tomatoes um, using um, a bottling method. It's quite a traditional, um, the old way people used to do it. Um, but in terms of like storing root vegetables and vegetables through the winter as they are, without processing them. Um, well, for example, this week we, we stored our remaining uh, winter squash. So um, for that, we've used a big metal crate that we have and we've surrounded the squash in there with hay. So the hay stops the cold and damp and frost getting at the squash, um, keeps them just about the right temperature um, and the metal box obviously protects them from rodents. So that's some core things you need to think about is um, temperature and ambience. So um, really like a cave, a cave type environment is, is the optimum for storing food. So even quite, because caves are they're quite filled with moisture, right? They can be, yeah. A nice dry cave is optimal okay. for what you want. So, um, or, you know, people often build like underground buried food storage. So it's all about trying to create a consistent temperature, a consistent cool temperature with minimal moisture. Um, doesn't get too warm, doesn't get direct sunlight, um, but also doesn't get too cold because you don't want frost getting to your to your vegetables. So those are core things about the space. And then one of the other big considerations is animals and animals getting into your vegetables. So particularly mice, rats, small animals like that. So um, yeah, there's many different ways to do that. Uh, I've seen great examples of just making like pallet crates. So get four or five pallets, make a crate. You could line that crate with, with uh, thin, uh, dense mesh and that would deal with your rodent issue. Um, and then you can store your vegetables in hay. Uh, so you can put potatoes in hay, you can put squash in hay um, inside there and seal it all up. And that's a really great way of storing uh, vegetables um, with things like um, carrots and parsnips. Um, probably sand is one of the best ways to store those. So storing them in sand. Um, you can also store them in soil. So that's another way to do it. So it's mimicking basically a carrot just staying out in the garden. Um, waiting to be harvested. Um, you can just leave things in the ground. So parsnips are really nice, just left in the ground. Leeks are really great, just left in the ground. Um, yeah, that's a few things, a few ways, but um, I recommend getting online. There's loads of great stuff. It's often kind of bringing back to life traditional ways of storing food that people used to use before they had fridges and freezers. And so yeah, there's lots of different ways. Um, depends on your space, depends on your situation. Um, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, that's it for today, everyone. Thank you. If you are interested, obviously today's video has been about seed saving. We made a video together around April time where we filmed at the CD Saturday event in April. We made a video about why it's so important to save seeds. And I think if you found this video from today really interesting, you would absolutely love it. So I'll leave a link for that at the end. But otherwise, thanks again and we'll see you next month. Cheers. See you in November. Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. In today's video, we are in the right month. We're in September, and again... <laughs> I did need Which April month to are we go. In? <coughs> October, you're in the wrong month again. August, September, October. August, September. Okay, today we are in the right month. It's October, is that right, no, April? September. <laughs> Trying to think of a seamless way to take it off. Needs working out. We'll get the transition because that's the most important thing. You're not here to learn about growing vegetables and agroecology, see, and how to speak correct. Jason. Welcome to the. <laughs> yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Gonna be some great outtakes from this. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> Wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> Are you pleased with yourself? Yeah. <laughs>